Hello, my name is Anna Woodhill and I'm a member of the family team at Thompson Snell and Passmore. I'm joined today by Harry Golding and Kirsty Law, who are also from the family team. During this month, we're looking at the law in relation to cohabiting couples. That's people who aren't married, who aren't in a civil partnership, but are living together. And what might happen either to protect their position on moving in with one another, or if the relationship were to break down and they separate. With the number of cohabiting couples steadily increasing in this country, questions such as these are all the more prevalent. So if I can start perhaps, Harry, um, for a couple who is thinking about moving in with one another or even already living together, is there anything that they can do to try and protect their position? And if they did, would it be legally binding, for example? So if there are disputes on separation, um, they, financial disputes, they tend to revolve around the main asset, which is the family home. Um, one of the sort of most straightforward ways of recording um, parties' interest in the family home is to a document known as a declaration of trust, which allows you to record sort of very basic percentage interests in the property. If you want to do anything a bit more um, nuanced uh, and you want to cover other aspects of um, financial arrangements, or you want to go into a bit more detail about contributions that might be being made to the property and how that will affect beneficial interests, um, we as family lawyers recommend a, a more thorough document known as a cohabitation agreement. Um, cohabitation agreements are uh, have, have a certain amount of, sort of formalities that need to be complied with in order to be as watertight as possible. Um, so it is worth getting advice at an early stage if you're interested in it. The um, in terms of whether or not they actually are binding, nothing that you do, nothing you sign can actually prevent a party from trying to litigate in the future. And that is always a possibility whether or not you get one of these documents. But what it does mean is if you comply with all the formalities, and as long as the sort of agreements between you are legitimate agreements, um, they will be upheld in a, in a court um, if someone ever tried to take to court. So it, it adds that level of certainty. I should caveat that certain provisions that can be dealt with in habitation agreements, such as future child arrangements between parties, can never be legally binding because that will always be dealt with based upon circumstances at the time. But it doesn't harm to record such intentions if that's what the parties want to do. Okay. And um, let's say we have a couple who have been living together, but they haven't put in place a cohabitation agreement. Um, in the event that they separate, sometimes we're asked about something called a common law spouse. Do, does that exist? If so, what it, is it? Um, so I think the idea of a common law spouse is a, sort of a myth, which is a very long lasting myth. Um, it, it seemed, the idea seems to be that if parties live together for a certain period of time, but they never actually sign the a marriage certificate or any sort of civil partnership um, uh, between the two of them, they will somehow, by virtue of having lived together as a married couple would have done, um, acquired the same sort of rights that a spouse would have acquired and have the ability to make a claim if they ever separate in the future. That is not something that exists in our law. Um, it, you, you cannot acquire those rights sort of over time in that way. Um, it is an important distinction because spouses on separation or in divorce uh, and civil partnerships on separation have a sort of a wide range of claims that they can make. And it's a very holistic exercise looking at all of the financial aspects of the relationship. Cohabiting couples are much more limited in the sort of claims they can make and the the areas in which they're able to sort of seek financial remedy uh, in the event of a separation. So particularly for financially weak parties, it is a sort of important not to fall into the trap of thinking that this common law spouse idea is a, is a thing in our law. Harry's mentioned there that the claims available to couples, were, if they're unmarried, aren't, aren't the same, aren't as extensive as married couples. Perhaps, Kirsty, you could talk about... Um, the claims that an unmarried person could make? Well, first of all, the position in relation to the arrangements for the children going forward is the same insofar as you can make the same applications under the Children Act for where the children should live, when they should spend time with each parent, where they should go to school and potentially prevent a parent from doing things. So those claims are the same because they focus on the children. But as Harry's explained, you don't acquire the ability to make spousal claims as a result of living with someone. So you can potentially make a claim in relation to a property that's jointly owned, as Harry said, to enforce perhaps the terms of the Declaration of Trust 
or the cohabitation agreement, but you can't, you don't just acquire a claim against a property because you've lived in it. And there are complex situations where if representations have been made and you've acted to your detriment as a result of those representations. So for example, if someone has said to you, if you make a contribution towards my mortgage, I'll give you an interest, even though that's not recorded, it is possible to argue that. But the difficulty is it's a question of both people giving evidence. And sometimes where promises have been made, there isn't any documentation to back them up. So much better, as Harry said, to have a declaration of trust. You can also make claims in respect of jointly owned assets. So if you've got a joint bank account that's been frozen, if you've got even something like contents that have been bought together, but you go back to exactly the same principles as if you were buying contents with buying items with a friend that you were living with. It's a question of who's bought them even diff more difficult with pets, who owns the dog, who owns the cat. So things like that, it's exactly why Harry's suggestion of having a cohabitation agreement is so important because there's no ability for a court to do what is fair. So if one person's bought the dog, but the other person has formed the relationship, fed it, walked it, done everything, <laughs> they're not gonna get the dog because they've lived together for years. So it is really important to appreciate that. It is possible to apply for maintenance for children if you've lived with someone because children are dealt with separately. The Child Maintenance Service deals with maintenance for people earning up to 156,000 a year, so most of the population. And the court does have the ability to order what's called top-up maintenance if there is a high earner and the court is satisfied they can afford to pay more. And there is also the potential, again, this isn't because you've lived with someone, this is because you have children to apply under Schedule 1, as well as top-up maintenance being available, you can apply for capital provision, but it has to be for the children. So the difference between a cohabiting couple and a married couple is that if you get capital for a house as a cohabiting couple, it will normally revert to the other parent when the child is 18 or finishes education, unless there are some special needs. Whereas with a married couple, you might get the capital to buy a house outright that you then keep after the children are 18. So there are significant differences and it is always worth taking advice when your relationship ends to check what applies, but do be prepared that if you've been living with someone unmarried, the advice you receive is likely to be, if you're the weaker financial party, a lot worse than if you were married. Thank you, Kirsty. So we've heard a bit about the more limited rights available to cohabiting couples on separation. And if you'd like to find out some more, you can listen to our second conversation where we talk about the future for cohabiting couples, whether reform is on the horizon and how you might look to resolve any issues in relation to a separation, be it financial or for children. If you'd like to find out more information, please get in touch via our website or you can contact any member of the family team. Thank you. Thank you.